Well, welcome everybody uh, to Linux Numbers this year. This is my first time joining this conference and today I have the honor to give the first presentation here. Uh, so let's get started. Um, for those of you that don't know me, my name is David. Um, I do memory management virtualization stuff at Red Hat. And today I want to talk about copy and write, get user pages and mysterious counters. Uh, in the first part of the presentation, I'm going to cover some background so we have some common understanding of um, which issues we are or we're fighting with. Um, then I'm going to explain something that went upstream recently, which is page on an exclusive um, to handle and it was handled correctly uh, in these regards. And I, I prepared some like questions for discussion. Um, if there are other questions or any other topics to discuss, we can can do that. And I'm not sure if we're going to be able to cover all of them. Let's see. So, uh, let's get started with some background. What is actually copy and write? Well, the idea of copy and write is fairly easy. You want to share a page without the other party being able to modify the page. Um, so you map that page lead on into the page table and whenever somebody wants to modify that page, you create a private copy, which in a Linux term is to create an anonymous page and replace it so you can write to that. Uh, in the context of this talk, we'll primarily focus on copy and write in the sense of private mappings, meaning we map private. There is also copy and write on file system level, like placing the and locating this. I can't read the slides. We're only going to cover copy and write with, for example, the shared zero page. So, uh, in the example below, you can see that like we have multiple page tables mapping the shared zero page, and as soon as one of these processes writes to um, that shared zero page, we're not going to allow that because the page is mapped read only. So we're going to create a private copy and our process is then able to read right to that page. Now, uh, copy and write not only applies to the shared zero page, we can also have it to uh, page cache pages, for example, in a private file mapping, um, or we can have shared anonymous pages. You might want to ask why do we even have, need shared anonymous pages? Yeah? I hope I can. I think that's the presenter. Should have attended that big blue button training session. <laughs> I think he's zoomed in. So um, when we fork a process, we don't want to copy all of the anonymous pages for our child process. So we just do it lazily on demand by sharing the anonymous pages between parent and child process. And the uh, same story as you can see in the example below. If anybody actually writes to such an anonymous page, we're going to uh, copy it and create a private anonymous copy for that. Uh, but of course, like uh, when would we actually want to copy? I mean, you could just go ahead and simply always copy. Like we have a shared anonymous page that's not read only. So, um, we just going to create a copy even if it's not necessary. Turns out that that can be quite wasteful. For example, if you fork a child process and that child process immediately quits, so you don't want to create a copy for each and every anonymous page. Uh, that you is uh, so you actually want to reuse these no longer shared anonymous pages. Let's call them exclusive anonymous pages. Which is, uh, and that can be a little bit tricky. Uh, and the traditional way was to uh, see one. like how many page tables are actually currently either directly or indirectly referencing uh, this uh, anonymous page to figure out if it's shared or no longer shared. And to, to throw in some mysterious counters that we use for that purpose, um, we, we will have the well-known ref count, also called page count, which is just like how many tracked references do we have to this folio? So um, uh, 
if you read all the folio, it's a collection of one up to uh, whatever number of pages uh, with like one common header. And we only track references oh, yeah. on the folio, yeah. not for each individual subject. Oh, yeah, right. We do have the swap count. The swap count essentially means like to a given sub page of a folio, um, how many swap PTs and page can the reference this uh, integrate. And then we have the map count, and that's where mm -hmm. stuff gets really complicated. We have a map count for each folio, which means oh, like if I just map, for example, transfer huge pages into a page okay. table, uh, I'm mapping the whole thing, and that's going to count as an entire map count of the folio. But then you can have nasty stuff where you uh, map a transfer huge page, for example, in subpage granularity, and you then have map counts for each individual subpage. So, uh, in order to figure out, well, a given subpage, how often is it mapped into a page table, we have to take a look at the entire map count plus the subpage map count, and eventually, like, if we want to make a decision if a shared anonymous page is no longer shared, we have to combine that even with the small count. That's um, where stuff really gets uh, a little bit complicated. So. The question is how can we detect if an uh, anonymous page is shared or exclusive? Uh, we could do that. We could take a look at the map count and the swap count under page log, see if it's one. That was the traditional approach, uh, which was problematic. Or you can just take a look at a ref count uh, and say, well, if there is more than one reference, clearly somebody else is doing something with, with the page. So it might, it might no longer be exclusive. And it would all make sense and it would all work unless there wouldn't be get user pages. And uh, for those of you that don't know what get user pages is, it's essentially a mechanism to traverse the page table of a process and look up a page that's mapped and just like grab a reference on that page and return it to the user. It's for example used for our direct, uh, P-Trace success, um, VFA or RDMA, IOU ring, it's all over the place and it's getting more more popular, so to say. And um, the various flavors and special cases we have doesn't necessarily make it any easier to understand. So for example, we have something called full gap, which means, well, I just want to grab the metadata of this page, but not uh, read or write page content, which is not used that way in the kernel, but that's a different story that has to be figured out. Uh, but then we also have full pin, which means like I really want to pin this page to, for example, read or write memory, let's say via odirect. Uh, we have full write, which just means, yeah, I have the intention of modifying the page versus I only want to read the page. And uh, what gets really ugly is, uh, for example, full force. Full force means like I have an unprotected range uh, in my process address space that I am, for, for instance, not allowed to write to. But with full force, you can bypass that and just say, yeah, well, I'm a debugger. I still want to write a breakpoint into whatever read-only mapped um, um, VMA. So I'm allowed to do that, and um, yeah, obviously just random code in the kernel can use full force with, with some not so good side side effects. We have group, group fast, uh, which is really nasty uh, in my opinion. It traverses page tables and looks looks up pages without taking any locks. So we have to be really careful when we unmap something or, or when we do certain operations on our page tables that. Um, Whatever we like, a good fast finds that it's actually consistent with what uh, a page table still have mapped. So just to give you some idea of like what are the issues that we're fighting with when we combine copy and write, especially of um, anonymous memory and um, get user pages. So this is the traditional approach where we want to detect exclusivity by uh, taking a look at a map count and a swap count. And this is the CV that has been reported in 2020 by Jan Horn. Um, essentially, you don't have to understand it in full detail, but what we have is we have a parent that has some anonymous memory. It uh, issues forks, so it shares this memory with the child process. Uh, and what a child does it is it uses get user pages to take a read-only pin on that memory, and it unmaps the page, so it no longer has access to this page content via its page table, but still via the, the the pin on that page. And after that point, if the parent modifies its own memory, you actually leak these modifications into your child process because the child process can just use, in this example, beam splice to still read that page via a um, pin that has been obtained via, via get user pages. So that already indicates like looking at the number of page table mappings might not be what we actually want. And uh, simplification and fix for it was well, let's use page count equals one. And 
how this can go wrong in, in subtle ways is a, a very rough example here. You also have to understand all of the details, but essentially what we do is we have some anonymous memory with some data and we register it as an IO U-ring fixed buffer, which in turn results in IO U-ring pinning that page. So IO U-ring now has a long-term pin on that page, so it expects like all modifications being done to that page to actually uh, be visible uh, to that page um, via IO U-ring. So in case we modify our um, memory now via our page tables, we would de detect, oh, well, there's more than one reference. Um, for example, if the page accidentally got mapped read-only in the meantime, which can happen for various reasons, we would replace the page in our page table and whatever um, the um, IOU ring obtained, like this pin is no longer referencing the same page as our page table. So if you would write out uh, in this example by IOU ring, the page content to a file, the file content would not match what's actually in the process page tables right now. So uh, to throw in some more mysterious counters, uh, we do have a pin count. Um, pin count tells us, well, how often has get user pages actually pinned this page using this magic for pin flag? Uh, and one interesting side note is that uh, it's only available for multi-page folios. So if you have a single base page, uh, it's not available. And um, in contrast to the documentation, it can be speculatively raised by good fast. So that means not even in that case, it's, uh, it's correct to rely on the value. Um, so we do have a primitive that's called folio, maybe DMA pinned, and it even applies like to these large folios that it's only um, guaranteed to not have false uh, negatives, but it can have false positives. Now you might wonder, but well, like if we have a single base page, with, which is just like if we don't have transparent huge pages and all of that, like how are we able to figure out if a page may be pinned uh, by group? And uh, actually we don't have a dedicated counter we, uh, because bits and the metadata and the struct page are rare. So um, smart people decided, and that, that's not a joke, to, uh, to mangle it into the ref count, which is actually a pretty, pretty neat idea, I think. And um, in, in case your ref count of a page is more than 1,024 uh, of an ordinary base page, you would say, oh yeah, this, this page might be pinned, um, but I'm not so sure, and I'm not able to find that out. Now, uh, the, the message of all of these mysterious counters here is like, how, so how are we even supposed to make any copy and write decision based on these yeah, uh, my mysterious counters? And uh, the answer is that maybe we really shouldn't, and that's where then um, the solution that we now have on anonymous memory comes into play, which is called page and exclusive. I'm only gonna like, describe the rough idea of what's happening without all of the dirty detail, but you can think of page and exclusive as kind of a flag for a page that tells us, is this page exclusive or has, is it maybe shared? Um, essentially, the, the, the rules are fairly simple, although the implementation is a little bit involved. So whenever you have a new anonymous page, let's say you have a new process, it writes into an anonymous VMA, that's private, you allocate a fresh anonymous page and that will be exclusive because it hasn't been shared. Um, and then what we do is we don't allow to pin pages that are not exclusive and we never share pages that might be pinned. And using that set of rules, I would say, you can then, yeah. This is the current situation. This is the current situation in the kernel. Uh, so you, you can actually say, well, uh, I can never have, um, anonymous page pin that is shared. And that's the most important part that we care about. So um, you might wonder, well, if we don't allow pinning an anonymous page that might be shared, what are we gonna do if we don't allow that? Well, the answer is fairly easy. If we want to take a read-only pin on the read-only mapped anonymous page that's not exclusive, we're gonna trigger unsharing. And unsharing might sound a little bit weird, but it's essentially a right fault without mapping the page writable. So we create a dedicated exclusive copy and we map it read only and everything keeps on working. And this work was inspired by Andreas Arkan Shelley work on that. So in our example, we would have a shared anonymous page mapped by two page tables. Uh, we're gonna trigger a write, uh, uh, we want to take a read only pin on, one, on this page, for example, via page table zero. In that case, we have to trigger unsharing. Unsharing would create like a private copy, just as we would do for a write fold. And uh, we would map that page read only because we're not intending to write to it. And at that point, we can again pin that page and everybody's happy. Um, now you might wonder, well, 
in our example on the right side, what would happen is somebody would try to pin the, uh, the page that's still mapped into page table one, because obviously it's not marked as exclusive, it might be shared. Uh, and the rule we apply here is we're only gonna reuse the page just if, if the page count is one. So um, at that point, we no longer have to deal with any kind of uh, correctness issues with pins getting out of sync or security issues. At that point, we just reuse it if there is a single reference and we can be sure that it's no longer shared. Uh, lately, we've seen some other uh, applications of page on an exclusive, which are, I think, quite nice. So, for example, what I added is when you have a protection change of a VMA range from uh, read-only to read-write, uh, what we can actually do is we can see test, well, if this page is exclusive, if it's an exclusive anonymous page, we can simply map the page immediately writable and essentially avoid a write fold in that case. And we, we can be sure that this is the correct thing to do because that just mimics what our new copy and write logic essentially does. If the page is exclusive, we can map it writable without any additional work. The other application that uh, I recently added is uh, actually a fix for a security issue that we found, uh, which is, um, we named it Dirty Cow for shared memory only. Uh, some of you still might recall what Dirty Cow was all about. You were essentially able to modify any uh, read-only file that you were able to map uh, using that mechanism. And here for this CV, it was essentially being able to only map or modify shared memory that you don't have write access to. And um, it's the same issue, same thing essentially, um, whenever we use this debug access, which is like using full force to bypass VMA restrictions uh, if we don't have write access, we're gonna make sure that we aren't allowed to pin a page that's exclusive and then we're, we're fine in that regard. Last but not least, something I'm working on right now is um, using the same mechanism in our NUMA hinting code. So NUMA hinting code is essentially uh, mapping a page prod none such that we will trap the next access and then we can decide if we want to migrate the page to some other memory location or not. And uh, one optimization we had was using the safe write infrastructure to, to avoid write faults after we, we had, for example, an initial read fault on, on some prod non protected page. And here again, we can essentially apply the same mechanism as for our mProtect um, yeah, upgrade of write permissions and replace saved writes. So that's not upstream yet, that's what I'm working on right now. So uh, what's missing? Um, on the one hand, huge TLB is still a problem. Uh, huge TLB, uh, if you recall, is um, having huge pages, not transparent huge pages, but real huge pages for processes, and they still use the map count to make copy and write decisions. And the issue is um, that we can actually result in unnecessary copies in the new approach, because if, you, if, if we consider our example again, um, we're only gonna reuse the page if there is a single reference on it, and that, of course, might mean that we might do an unnecessary copy in certain cases. And HTB cannot really deal with that because it's a fixed pool size and if you would do an unnecessary copy you would deliver and you're running out of huge pages, you would uh, essentially send the process a sick bus and kill it. So we cannot really do that. Odirect still uses the wrong interface for pinning and unpinning pages. Uh, it uses full get and not full pin, but John Hubbard is working on that actively. And the nice thing, once we have that in place, is that we can actually remove from our man pages the notion that Odirect and fork should not be used because from that point on, it should be fully functional, just like it, how it's supposed to be. Uh, we have to preserve uh, the exclusive flag on more architectures, so that's a minor detail. Whenever we swap out a page on some architectures, we lose that exclusive information, which is not too bad because the page cannot be pinned if we actually succeed in, in swapping the page out. Uh, but, of course, it means that we might detect pages as not exclusive and maybe shared instead of yeah, just detecting it properly and avoiding some corner cases of performance issues. I mentioned good fast handling. Good fast is uh, very tricky, and we have one pending fix for a page and an exclusive um, where we race between pinning a page and clearing the flag, and it's all a big mess and mystery, uh, but we're getting there. And of course, we need self test to make sure that it's not silently breaking again, uh, which has been the case a couple of times already, and I'm working on that. Having that said, um, are there any questions, any topics for discussion? Otherwise, otherwise I would just start going over my topics and um, yeah, start doing that. Not?
we're going to talk. And maybe, maybe you, Matthew might have a comment regarding. <laughs> You mentioned earlier on that there's going to be some special games played with uh, zero size, uh, zero order folios. I'm wondering how far are we away from being able to separately allocate folios? Because then that will list a lot of those restrictions, restrictions on what we can have in a folio. And if that makes need for special games and hacks go away, maybe we could put some more effort in that direction. Uh, good point. Um, at, at this point, with page and exclusive, I don't think we're talking about hex anymore. Um, but I agree that especially the pin count might deserve some attention. And I think John, John, you also had some concerns regarding the pin count. I think unreliability with file file back pages. So for anonymous pages, I think we're good. But especially with page cache pages, I remember John had some issues with that. Uh, yeah. The the problem is that. Like you said, we're we're using an, an additional page to store an accurate pin count. So if you have more than one page in your folio, great. If you only have one page, then you need somewhere to store that ref count, like you already pointed out. And and Matthew is um, uh, turning the pages inside out so that I I think we can put a counter in there. Yeah. Um, yeah, um, so my, my, my hope is actually to do away with or at least significantly shrink map count. And so we just get to a saturated map count and, and, and give up trying to keep an accurate count. I'm not sure we're going to get there. I think I may have overlooked something important, but that's, that, that, that's where I'm currently looking. Uh, that, that would have let us have a definitely hit, but um, again, the pin count will also have to saturate. So. Right. And, and I, there was another case of maybe, you know, you said, well, it's maybe for two reasons. One is because you might be able to look at the ref count, which, you know, Matthew's thing would fix. Um, and then the other one is the speculative um, case rate. So that we could fix that. Or we could change it. Not fix it because good fast would get significantly more complicated than it already is. But and I don't think that's ever going to be a deal because you, it, you say, well, I speculatively pinned it. Well, you still pinned it. So it's not maybe anymore. At that level. Yeah, but you, you no longer you, you no longer know if the page is actually still mapped into your page table. So it could have been mapped by somebody else, and you would flag it as pinned. Mm -hmm. Although, like mm -hmm. it, it, it would have so get good. pinned by a different process, and these are semantics. Mm -hmm. For example, if you would want to use mm -hmm. the pin yeah, count in pocket write logic, like if yeah. something is pinned, I always yeah. have to reuse it. You yeah. would be able to do that yeah. as long as the pin count might be speculatively with. But I think you can still change the name to. I think we can almost certainly get rid of the main for anonymous okay. pages because we know that a shared page cannot be pinned. So, like, you would have to get 1024 references on a random page, on, a, on an exclusive anonymous page to run into the issue. So, for anonymous pages, it's easy. For file or page cache pages, it's, it's hard. And I think that's too easy. I, I guess where I was going with this was in the future when we get to the no more overloading, so there's no 1024, we have a separate counter, you still have speculative, but I'm saying in that case, I don't think you need to say maybe anymore, you could say, you know, is, is team at the end, even if it's temporary. Yeah, it really depends on the use case. There was a discussion about using the pin count, like, is, is this page pinned in pop and write context? Like, if, is, if this page is pinned, I'm always going to reuse it. But with speculative really raising that, you could run into issues. So um, I, I completely agree that we could look into that and maybe like we don't maybe don't need a pin count that is 30 to bit wide like we would have to figure out what actually makes sense then and this might get tricky with the page cache and when we use like um also the pin count for all direct in all of these cases like what would be a good number that that you want to have like how many people can concurrently read via all direct from a page cache page how many processes and that would be interesting i think Crazy, crazy ID. Uh, what about just like merging KSM, like kernel share memory, with all these map count, uh, copy and write, so that we only have one mechanism? Like, so, so KSM is uh, sharing the same page read only, and technically copy and write is the same ID, really, if you think about it. Well, not totally, but it's a crazy idea, just like. <laughs> 
that a while back. Remember that made that made it into the document on separate splitting up struct page and separately allocating those objects. And I think the thing that we talked about was a KSM would be a separate type of object than a folio. And a KSM would have multiple folios hanging off of it. So yes, it's on the roadmap, but we need to first get to separately allocating folios. Which is a five-year project. <laughs> I mean, let, let, let's be clear, that's not happening anytime soon. If, if we're talking about something we're doing like next year, it's not separately allocated folios. Talking about here, because when that happens, then all the things that you're talking about here of deciding how many bits we need for this counter, uh, bias counts, don't need to play those games anymore. It just won't be that big of a deal to have another eight or 16 bytes in the folio. So if there's things that people could, could do to help out to get us a little bit closer to separately alloc allocated folios, I think we should seriously like talk about that. No. I think we might still like uh, what I recall from all of the um, like metadata optimizations, dynamically allocating it. We could actually have for page cache pages and for anonymous pages, we could have different metadata and the size could vary. Correct. Uh, that 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 is the the the, the destiny. Yeah, that we do intend to have def different structs for anonymous and and page cache memory. And for example, for anonymous pages, we might not need that. We might not need a reliable pin count. Um, because it might be reliable enough, but for page cache pages, as John raised, we might want that. And we're not playing too many games now with anonymous memory. It's, it's, it's. It, it, I think it's, uh, it's handleable. Like if you have like, you you would need 1,024 references on an exclusive anonymous page. And if like everybody or direct and so forth is is actually just using the pin interface, then who should take 1,024 pins and page, uh, references on a page? It's not going to happen. Um, but yeah, for page cache pages, I, I agree that this might might be a very good thing that we can allocate this metadata dynamically and squeeze the pin count in there, um, or yeah, modify the map count. I, th I think we're already out of time. <laughs> yeah, I'm inclined to give you a couple of extra minutes because you did have to start us a little late while we did the intros. But uh, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll wrap it up soon. I just wanted to say, I, I really like the questions you've asked at the end there, particularly about do we need to need a map count per THP subpage? Because that is something that we need to get rid of in order to move to separately allocated. So it doesn't just help us in the future, it helps us like right now. Also, it's it's going to be a huge performance win because right now you to get a map count, you have to scan all 512 times 64 byte pages in order to uh, find out what your, what your accurate map count is. And it's a pain because it's almost always zero. <laughs> so the, the, the issue is here, so the, the, the general idea is that like we have these map counts per sub page and like we don't really need that anymore for uh, making copy and write decisions to handle that correctly. So the question is like, what else does actually need a reliable map, map count? And I think like the most prominent examples detecting if there are other page table mappings, for example, in our map code, the issue is if you have a combined map count for a transparent huge page, for example, you account everything to like the, the head page or whatsoever. Um, if you have like a transparent huge page map via, uh, via PDEs, you would already have 512. So um, making the map count less reliable would mean you have to keep at least 512 um, to only be able to identify it's it, like this, it's mapped once into a process. And that's then I guess the interesting discussion like can we get rid of the transparent like of the sub page map count i think we can to some degree um i'm not sure about like all of these games that the page cache pages are playing with that but um you, you might know better than me for anonymous pages we might not need that yeah i think we need to get into a hack room at some point fairly soon and figure this out because <laughs> i think you know a lot more about anonymous memory than i do and i know more about page cache memory than you do and yeah we just need to figure this out all right, let's uh, let's let's wrap, let's up wrap it up. Thank exactly. you so much, David. Sure. Applause, everyone. <laughs>